It started off as a really simple, cute idea to pay tribute to my favorite childhood toys. When I started Way to the Woods, and I was in high school, like in year 11, 12, and at that time in my life, the unknown was um, everything. So I just want to make a game that my mum can play. She's one of my biggest supporters, but because games are such an isolating and gated off medium, she actually can't engage with a lot of my work, even though she'd love to. As you can probably see already, uh, it looks like it's a comedy game, but it's actually not. So we've... <laughs> Maybe we, we stuff that up. They wanted to make more things that were meaningful. They wanted to make games about love and identity and life. And I was like, nah, I just wanna... I just wanna, you know, drive around, maybe to the horn. Hi, I'm Matt. I make paint game. Um, I'm Marigold. Um, my name's Anthony Tan. My name is Olivia. And this is our game, Push Me, Pull You. We're making web. A little game that we've been working on for a while called Heavenly Bodies. And tonight I was just sort of hoping to talk about my game for a bit. Birt is a racing game. Racing and shooting game. Uh, made out of a car. Uh... Welcome to Parallels, uh, Freeplay's first ever showcase. Welcome again to Parallels 2017. It's the Freeplay 2019 showcase. And welcome to Parallels 2020. Hello everyone, and welcome to Parallels, the free play 2021 showcase of independent games and experimental art. I'm your host, Chad Toprak, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the curator of Parallels and the director of free play. 
the world's longest running independent games festival. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that free play hosts and broadcasts from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all First Nations people who may be joining us live today or tuning in later. Sovereignty was never ceded and the violence of the colonial project is still ongoing. A bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're watching this live, uh, you can join us at the Free Play Parallels Zone, an online social space set in RMIT's The Capital. You can join the zone by simply going to freeplay.zone. Um, I want to remind you all that uh, Free Play has a safer spaces policy in place for both the um, online chat and the, the zone. Um, our team will do their best to ensure that you'll feel safe throughout the event. You can review the policy on our website or in the video description. Um, one last reminder to check out the Parallels 2021 merch store. Um, you can find the link to the, uh, to the merch store in the video description or on our website. The hashtag uh, for tonight is Parallels21. We encourage you to tweet about the event. Um, you can also use the Migua21 hashtag as well. A little bit about um, this evening's format. Um, we have a curated selection of seven local and international artists, game makers, designers, and coders, um, who will take turns presenting a short talk about themselves, their project, and their journey through their creative practice. Some of the speakers will play their games uh, live, uh, while others will simply present a short talk accompanied by slides or video. Um, each talk goes for about 10 minutes. Um, short talks, heartfelt games, that's the very essence of Parallels. Parallels highlights some of the most unique, experimental and culturally significant work being made in Australia and beyond. Parallels is also a trendsetter, often showcasing your next favourite games and game makers. Free Play Independent Games Festival is the host of Parallels, where a not-for-profit organisation that celebrates the art and culture of independent games. And we do that through spotlighting and platforming emerging and marginalised artists and championing Australia's leading independent and experimental game makers. Um, we exist within the fringes and margins, uh, and margins of uh, independent, alternative, and experimental games. Free Play has been encouraging critical, personal, political, cross-disciplinary expression and, uh, and engagement um, for about 17 years. Um, we're committed to fostering an inclusive, positive, and playful culture and framing game making as arts practice. <clears throat> we wouldn't be able to host these wonderful events without the amazing support of our community and our partners. So I'd like to take a quick moment to thank a few people and partners. First off, I'd like to thank Creative Victoria uh, for having us on board this year's Melbourne International Games Week. I'd like to thank RMIT for blessing us with such a beautiful venue um, for the Free Play Zone. A big thank you to our sponsors, House House and Two Point Interactive. We wouldn't be able to do uh, what we do without your support. Uh, so thank you. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the Parallels 2021 team, Ben Turner, Pritika Sachdev, Goldie Bartlett, Terry Burdak, for all of their hard work across the last couple of months uh, and making something so special and beautiful. So thank you so much and I love you all. A huge thank you to Jay Stewart, uh, Cecile Richard and Andrew Gleason for blessing us with the free play zone. It's such a special space. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for pouring so much of your love and passion uh, that you have for the community into the zone. Um, thank you to Cole Williams for the fantastic Parallels visual identity that you see um, this evening. Please buy yourselves some merch. Um, our store link, uh, like I said, is, is in the video description or, or on our website. Um, thank you to Dan Golding um, for cutting together yet another kick-ass trailer. 
uh, and all the wonderful um, music that you heard during the, um, the opening. Um, I, I always look forward to the trailers each year, so thank you, Dan. Um, a big thank you to the Free Play Board uh, for their continued support and guidance. And a massive thank you to everyone who bought support passes uh, for this year's Parallels. Um, your support means the world to us, and it really does make a big difference. Um, so from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Support passes are still available. If you'd like to contribute to free play, you can find the link in the video description. Thank you to all our speakers for uh, trusting free play with their stories and their time. And finally, a heartfelt thank you to all of you who are watching. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the night. Joining us from ACT is Dana McKay. Uh, Dana is a writer and game designer who likes to write stories about characters and their connection to one another. Tonight, Dana will be presenting A Long Goodbye, a short narrative game centered around two old friends who have to say their final goodbye over the phone. Hi, I'm Dana McKay, the creator of A Long Goodbye. It's a short narrative game centered around two old friends who have to say their final goodbye over a phone conversation. You might recognize it from this year's Free Play Awards as the winner of the Excellence in Narrative category or over at Acme's Big Games Night in Exhibition. In this presentation, I'll talk about the writing and design of the game and also why I made it. Just before we start, I thought I'd properly introduce myself. So hello, I'm Dana. I am a writer and game designer based out of Canberra, Australia. I studied at the Academy of Interactive Entertainment for Game Design, and by the time that this talk comes out, I will have started my first job in the gaming industry. So getting back to the game, uh, as I mentioned, A Long Goodbye is a short narrative game, and it focuses on using a realistic conversation structure, with each reply moving the conversation down a new winding path. Uh, it's meant to be played through multiple times to explore new topics and learn about the characters, their shared history, estrangement, and the things they leave unsaid. This is a game that I definitely made with love, and also because of an assignment. Uh, I had five weeks to make a game, and I definitely took the opportunity to choose a narrative one, since it's definitely something I'm passionate about. For me, I think the game is important because it's about very real people in a very real situation, even if I couldn't resist putting in an out-of-this-world twist that I think is a really interesting topic and dynamic for a video game. So while I was making A Long Goodbye, I had three main goals in mind. The first was to have strong tone. The second was a realistic conversation structure. And the third was being smart with the scope since I only had those five weeks. Getting into the actual writing and design, I'll start with the writing side. Uh, even though that the design and writing is very interconnected, I'll try and separate them a little bit. Uh, I'll also try and keep this fairly spoiler-free, but there will be a little bit. So in terms of writing, I knew I wanted to tackle a goodbye. I thought that was a really interesting subject matter. And so I started out with the core idea of goodbyes are hardly ever easy and never say what they're meant to. So for me, what that meant was a story about two people that love each other very, very much, and they don't know how to convey that in a 10 minute conversation. They don't even want to try because they know they won't be able to. And despite not saying it, it still comes across regardless. So what I actually did, I made a bullet point list of what I thought would hit hardest in a story like that. So that was things like, uh, there's no running reunion at the airport and that the cause of their estrangement and all the tension that they have in this conversation is due to mistakes they've made or actions they've taken. I think that was a really important part of keeping the tone of the game. So I very much wanted to take a route which was bittersweet and not depressing. So I know uh, watching a lot of people play, they thought the game was about death. And while there are themes of death, uh, it's definitely not about that. Um, so I definitely try to take it in a different direction. A really important part of the writing was trying to instill that sense of realism. And that wasn't just in the design part, which I'll get to in a minute. It was also in the characters' dynamics, how they speak to each other, what they speak about. 
the dynamic was a really interesting part to write. I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, it was really interesting to write about who they were and who they are now and kind of how those two versions match up and how they play off of each other. And I think that's really the core of the game. Uh, there was definitely a really big challenge in writing uh, since I only had dialogue. So I couldn't rely on animations or prose or even voice actors. All I had was the text on the screen. That meant I had to stay really focused on keeping these characters feeling unique uh, to each other. So, you know, the simple stuff like Bob will swear a lot more than Charlie and Charlie has like a much drier wit, things like that. I did still try and put narrative in other parts of the story so you can see uh, the state of Charlie's car and even his phone screen, his call history, is very telling. Uh, but otherwise, it was really that focus on dialogue and making that snappy and realistic and heartfelt. But overall, I felt it did come together really well. Um, and I really enjoyed writing these two characters and I think people have really enjoyed playing through as these two. So on to design. Uh, the biggest part of the design for this game was definitely the conversation structure. It was actually how you interact with the story, since there's no point of having a good story in interactive fiction if it doesn't feel nice to interact with. Uh, so for me, I'll throw it up on screen, is the graph. So this is the structure I designed to uh, try and emulate that realistic feeling of conversation. It was really good because it let me maintain that 3x structure that you see in most stories. Uh, that I feel is really important for the pacing and kind of overall experience of a narrative. So the conversation topics were definitely the secret source of the feeling of a realistic conversation. And that boiled down to a couple of main points. So structure and content was really important. So that's how you navigate through them and what they actually contain. So there was a lot of talking about very casual topics and then also some more hard hitting topics. Each topic also had multiple entry and exit points, which I thought was really important since you jump around them a lot. Uh, it also brought in a lot of variety going through multiple playthroughs since depending on the topic that preceded it, uh, it can really change the content of you know the next one. The narrative also influenced the topics a lot and how they get brought up in the story. So a really good example is the funeral topic. Bob will always try and bring it up in most other topics, whereas Charlie will always try and avoid it. And I thought that was a really important part of uh, making the writing and the design really work together. Lastly, it was definitely a challenge getting this all done in five weeks. It was to the last minute. Uh, there's definitely a fair amount of jank still in the game, and I'm pretty sure if any artists or programmers actually looked at it in engine, they would cry. So overall, the game is just a tearjerker. <laughs> Some parts definitely got cut. Uh, there was a sentiment tracker originally that would track the kind of tone of the conversation, which I decided to drop and I think that actually probably worked in its favour. I definitely think this game is a good example of uh, less is more. I think keeping it to such a concise experience really works in its favour. I think overall for me the most important part of this game is just the story between these two people and it's about you know two people who can't fit together anymore uh, but they still love each other and they have to figure out what that means when they're apart and i think what other people found really important about it is you know they've been in that position before they they've been bob or they've been charlie or they've been you know them at different times and i think that's what really connects uh, it was especially great to watch that because I'm still nervous about showing my own writing and being able to see those live reactions or people that have recorded it on YouTube or left me comments is a really amazing thing to see. On that note, thanks for tuning into this talk and also thank you to Freeplay for giving me this opportunity. You can find me at a couple of places online, either on my itch page or my very quiet Twitter at FixGrit or at my website. This week I'll also be on the Big Games Night and Discord server talking to people, so check out how you can join that through Acme Socials. If you have any questions, totally reach out and I will try my best to answer them. Otherwise, goodbye. Thank you, Dana. Um, up next we have Billy Dent from Victoria. 
Uh, Billy is a full-time pirate, part-time clown, and occasional game developer, currently studying game design in Melbourne. Billy loves crafting strange but sincere characters and worlds, taking inspiration from an overly online childhood of webcomics, remix culture, and low-quality anime rips. Uh, tonight, Billy will be presenting Monomyth, a relaxed and surreal walker that pokes fun at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Hey everyone, and hello to the Free Play Zone. My name is Billy Dent. I'm a game design student here at RMIT in Melbourne, and I'm here to talk about my game Monomyth, but mostly a bunch of other weird stuff. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm recording this presentation on the stolen lands of the people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. I also want to dedicate a moment to my friend Scout, who I learned had passed away the same night I was invited to present to you all. I'm incredibly privileged to have this opportunity to enjoy tonight's games with you, but I'm reminded that the best thing about free play isn't the, just the games, it's, uh, it's the people and the team who put in the work to make our spaces and the world a kinder place. I hope you're all taking care of the vulnerable people in your friend groups and your communities, especially right now. So I wanted to give my presentation a fun little name. Uh, we're calling this one Growing Up on Trash Mountain, the freest place on earth. It's gonna take some time to get to the peak of that mountain, so stick with me, all right? I'm gonna start by describing the plot of a short film. The main character of this film is a man whose life is defined by his excitement for an upcoming movie. As the film begins, he arrives at his friend's house and wonders aloud why the movie still hasn't been released. His friend delivers him the bad news. It's gone. Cancelled. It's not coming. And with nothing to look forward to, our protagonist promptly jumps off the balcony and discovers that the afterlife is the movie, which he experiences both as an observer and as a participant. Unfortunately, his joy is almost immediately interrupted as he wakes up in a hospital, surrounded by his friends apparently surviving the fall. He calls out to one of his friends and he begs them to kill him, knowing paradise exists on the other side and it's waiting for him. His friend obliges and he returns to the world of his movie. Moments before he sees the end though, he wakes again in an unfamiliar place resurrected by aliens as the last enduring memory of the human race. The aliens are able to provide him with the movie, ironically having released some time after his death, and he finally sees the end. It sucks, like really sucks. But in his disappointment, the protagonist realizes he was always wrong to think 90 minutes of cinema was going to give his life meaning. And with the help of the aliens, he returns to the beginning of the story, ready to live his life to the fullest. Okay, like, pretty weird story for sure, but you can kind of imagine this as a solid, like, absurdist dark comedy, right? This is the plot to Guanam's Great Adventure, or Dino Time Enough for Love, a YouTube poop from 2013. And uh, for those of you who don't know, YouTube poops are a sort of video collage that takes existing media, usually like games and cartoons and splices it into something else. Usually a bunch of dumb non sequiturs and toilet humor. My name is Josh Van Josh. But this YouTube poop is constructed mostly out of clips and characters from the infamously bad it's Zelda CDI games, uh, which is actually a really, really popular YouTube poop source with Guanam the Wizard as our protagonist, who, by the way, has like three lines in the game. The subject of his obsession is Dino Time, a fiercely mediocre animated kids film that Basically, nobody remembers, assuming they've even seen it. I'd be impressed if anyone in the audience has seen it. But it probably goes without saying, this is like absolutely ridiculous, right? Nothing about that game or that movie have anything to do with the story I described. It's like this weirdly ambitious parable with an entire character arc delivered in eight minutes. And it just happens to be iconic game hero Link singing, I like this, but, and I cannot, why? It's got an incredibly immature sense of humor, in all honesty, and it occasionally is kind of gross, but I feel like it still slaps. And more importantly, it's total trash. And it's what I was raised on. The very first YouTube video I ever watched 
was called Kirby is Blue. It's just clips of the Kirby anime, which I'd never seen before, mind you. Uh, drenched in a blue filter with Eiffel 65's I'm Blue playing over it. Six-year-old me thought this was way more interesting than whatever was on the TV, so I just stopped fighting my sister for the remote and started watching trash on YouTube every day. Some people have another name for trash, though. Remix culture. And for many early Zoomers like myself, that remix culture defined our existence of growing up extremely online. I watched a ton of YouTube poops, but that was only the beginning. And some of these things might be more relatable to you guys. Anime music videos, Gary's Mod animations, Minecraft parodies, Naruto doing caramel dance, and every meme ever made, Homestuck. I've watched numerous characters be completely democratized by the internet, warped beyond all sense of recognition by fans, and those versions of the characters are the ones that live in my head. Complete trash, right? But trash is cool as hell. It's cool. It's almost always interesting to reinterpret, recontextualize, reuse, re like reinvent wherever you want to use an existing work as a springboard for your like unique message and creative vision, or I just want to pretend that Gordy from Pokemon is my boyfriend. I think we all understand that the concept of originality is flawed, everything's done before, etc. I, I think it's the right attitude, but like, do we apply it equally? Your Mario-inspired 2D platformer absolutely deserves respect for what it accomplishes, whether it's original or not. But what about the three-hour-long animated YouTube series where Mario fights Sonic and does a Kamehameha? Is that worthy of the same respect? Uh, does it get to be art? I mean, I'd like to see Mr. Miyamoto try and make anything like that. I believe what defines trash, all the stuff I've talked about, is that it's not a shame to let people know it owes its existence to someone else. And here's where it comes full circle, because Monomyth, it's trash. Confession time, I made nearly none of the assets in Monomyth. I wrote what little code there was, I drew the UI graphics, I crafted this MS Paint smiley face you're seeing here, I, I wrote the dialogue, but half of the characters are just ripping off one piece. I've got my friend Audrey to thank for the post-processing shaders. I've got my, my friend Oscar to thank for some of the music. And I have a ridiculous number of strangers to thank for everything else. The very premise of the game is that I took Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey, essentially the like default story, and I interpreted it in the most literal surface way, um, surface level way possible, and still made something unique and appealing. Like, Monomyth is an obvious trash, right? I didn't use Goombas for enemies or anything. You can't tell unless you know and you're like on the Unity Asset Store a lot. But it was born and bred on Trash Mountain nonetheless. And to be honest, that fact makes it really hard for me to feel like I belong here talking to you all tonight. Every single other game in the showcase tonight is beautiful. I feel like I just put a nice looking filter over a shrine to the Unity Asset Store. But while writing this script, I had to think, and I remember that my favorite Pokemon game is made by fans out of stolen sprites, and that the single most important piece of media to me shamelessly inserts 90s Americana all over the place. Younger creators like myself often feel that doing everything from scratch, obfuscating your inspirations is how you make something worthy of respect. You need to like pretend that you've did it all on your own, you know, I grabbed this mesh from the internet. I reused the boat animation. The game is going to call me lazy. I am lazy. And I mean, you know, maybe I am lazy, but people like Monomyth. And I love trash. You should go make some. Thank you. Squad alive, we are off. And I'm George Bear. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, up next is Mel Taylor from Queensland. Mel is a narrative and game designer and director of Mellow Games. She's been making games in the industry for more than seven years with a focus on high emotional impact and meaningful themes, most notably as a co-creator of the award-winning Orwell series. Uh, Mel, will, Mel will be presenting a special game tonight called Blueberry. 
a surreal and heartfelt game that explores the life of a woman from birth to death. Hi, I'm Mel Taylor. I'm a narrative designer based in Brisbane, and I run a studio called Mellow Games. We are currently working on a game called Blueberry um, with a team of four people. That's me doing the art and the narrative design, Anders Gröningstetter doing the music and sound design, David Kilford doing programming, and Phoebe Askell doing 2D animation. Blueberry is a journey through a woman's mind from birth to death in which you climb a tower called the Tower of Life, which is a symbol for her inner psychological world. The higher you climb, the older you get, and on your way up, you find doors that lead to her memories. Blueberry is structured in four phases. So at the beginning, Blueberry is a child, then she becomes a teenager, then an adult, and then an elderly lady. And depending on which life phase she is in, the levels change, and especially the tower changes a lot. For example, when she's a kid, the tower is more playful and vibrant colors and uh, leaves flying around and happy and music. And when she's a teenager, she's pretty angsty and quite depressed. And there's a storm and it's raining and it gets dark. So um, depending on her emotional states and moods, the tower changes. And regarding the mini games, these are usually little things um, from her life. For example, as a child, you uh, steal the cookies from a jar that mom has hidden on the highest shelf and you have to get up there by stacking pots and pans. Or at some point you're in the bedroom and you she wants to go to bed and then you have to find a flashlight in order to get rid of a monster under her bed. So all of these child play things. And as a teenager, the games are a little bit more dialogue based. And at this point, we also introduce a mechanic that's called the blues mechanic, which is a bit like, I call it an inverted health bar. So the goal is to keep it as far away as possible from becoming full. So you want to keep it at, um, close to 0% and keep Blueberry's blues low, basically. And you can do this by picking up items like food in order to make her feel better or um, when there's dialogue in the game, words influence the ups and downs of the blues bar. So that means when, depending on what you say, characters are nice to you or they can be mean to you and then this will also influence the blues bar. At some point we use this mechanic as well for word fights. So, for example, in the late teenager phase, Blueberry has a fight with her mom, and in this fight, she has a blues bar, but mom also has a blues bar. So the goal is to keep your own blues bar as low as possible, and the character that has 100% blues first basically loses the fight and storms out. And depending on how this word fight goes, the story also changes. The inspiration for Blueberry came from different sources, not just games. The first time I started thinking about the concept was when um, I read a book called The Coma, which I really loved by Alex Garland, who also wrote The Beach, which is probably his most famous book. Um, and in this book, a guy gets beaten up and then he falls into a coma. And basically the whole book is about him trying to find out who he is by going through his memories. And, um, so the premise is that if he finds out who he is, he will be able to wake up from the coma. 
And at some point he asks himself, well, what makes me me? And am I still me anyway? Because I don't know who I am. So if I lose a limb, for example, no one would doubt that I'm still me. But I, if I lose my mind, am I still myself? And I thought that this was a very interesting thing to explore. Another inspiration was from a studio called Tale of Tales, which I really liked from Belgium, a two-person team who used to do very experimental games, and one of them was called The Graveyard. And this was about an old lady who walks across a graveyard and then sits on a bench, and that's most of the game. And the player sort of goes from one end to the graveyard to the other and then sits down, and then the old lady sort of goes through her memories and thinks about the past and whatever she did with her life. And I thought it would be interesting to have an elderly character in a game because I think it's very fascinating how people who are pretty old can sort of look back on their lives and on the things that they have experienced that made them wiser. And um, I was wondering why there are so few old characters in games, so that's another thing I wanted to explore. Gameplay-wise, I would say Night in the Woods was a big inspiration because it's a really interesting mix of platforming and storytelling, although Night in the Woods is probably more about the characters, how they interact and communicate, than about the platforming itself. Another game that inspired me was To the Moon, which I really loved. And it's probably the most similar one narrative-wise because you also go through someone's memories, only that um, you go basically backwards from the memories of him being pretty old towards the end of his life to the memories of childhood. And there's also a story unraveling through this in a similar way. To me, Blueberry is a very personal game, but it's also important to say that it's not about me. I think I wanted to make something that um, helped me get past my own trauma and something that also shows other people that it is possible to live a happy life even if you had a very difficult past. And that's kind of what happens in Blueberry. Um, on the other hand, there is a sort of one event that the player can find out about, but it's sort of important to know this bigger picture. And at the center of this lies the symbolism of a puzzle that you put together one by one. So each of the memories that you play um, earn you a puzzle piece and um, the higher you climb the more puzzle pieces you get and each puzzle piece if you insert it to a panel in this tower world you get a new section of the tower that means for example a bridge or a ladder so that you can climb higher at one point in the game you will notice that there are holes in this puzzle and these holes are missing memories, which you have to retrieve. And the way you do that is you use memory links that remind Blueberry of these certain points in her life that you have already played. And then you can revisit this memory, which will show up in a sort of sepia color, and it will recontextualize the scene that you have already played so that because she sees it from a different perspective as she ages, it will change. And then you will also be able to find the missing memories in this area of the tower that you go back down to. Blueberry is on Steam. You can wishlist it. And we also have a demo that you can currently play. If you want to get updates about the game, do follow us on Twitter at GamesMellow. Or you can hit me up on Twitter if you have questions. My handle is at mel underscore underscore T-E-A. Or you can send me an email, mel at mellow minus games dot com. 
and I'm happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity to speak at Parallels. I really love this event a lot and have a good night. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, our next game is actually completely non-digital. Um, it's, a, it's a tabletop game. Um, our, our speaker is Aaron Lim, uh, joining us from Malaysia. And Aaron is a designer of tabletop games. His work ranges from board and card games to story games and tabletop RPGs. Most of his work is self-published. Um, today, he'll be presenting his tabletop storytelling game an altogether different river, uh, where players collaboratively uh, create a fictional town and together uh, play out how it changes throughout the, um, sorry, through the lens of, of those who left and returned and those who stayed throughout. Hello Parallels, my name is Aaron Lim and I'm a tabletop game designer based in PJ Malaysia. Uh, but I also used to be based in uh, Melbourne up until 2019 when I moved back. Uh, and I'm here to talk about an altogether different river, which is a tabletop role-playing game or storytelling game that I uh, designed and released uh, this year. Uh, I released a, a PDF or uh, digital version on uh, itch.io and I also did a short print run uh, of a zine version of the game, uh, which is probably a little bit harder to get. Um, yeah, so I will start that now. Uh, so what is an altogether different river? Uh, as I mentioned, it is a tabletop RPG or story game, uh, and it also is GM-less or, or GM-full in the sense that like everyone uh, has equal, say, like a GM uh, in a tabletop story game. So it's something closer to something like The Quiet Year uh, or, or to Microscope or Follow uh, than something uh, traditionally GM'd adventure RPG like uh, D&D or Blades in the Dark. Um, and um, it is about uh, collaboratively creating a town together. Uh, you draw a map of, uh, uh, of the town, um, and then you see how that town uh, changes over time uh, through the lens of the, the characters that you create and play. Uh, and the two types of characters that you have are those who return, uh, people who left the town at some point in the past and then uh, recently ha have returned. Uh, and those who remain are, are those people who stayed in the town throughout that time. Um, and uh, you play out uh, their reactions and relationships with each other uh, and how they feel about the changes in the town and the changes in each other. Uh, and you do that uh, in a collaborative like storytelling uh, manner. Um, so the key design pillars of the game are, are place, uh, a time or change and relationships. Um, and I drew very heavily from uh, Microscope uh, uh, by Ben Robbins, which is one of my favorite games, um, in, in the sense of like having three uh, different actions in the game that reflect those design pillars or like, um, uh, or drill down uh, 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 into more and more detail uh, in the game. So the three ways that you do that are by expanding on the town, like you collaboratively create a town using a method that I borrowed from uh, Caroline Hobbs' Downfall, which is another great game. Um, and then you expand it by like adding aspects to the town. So on, on your turn, you can like you know expand and like add new um, new bits of the town, which could be physical places or like people in the town or or um, uh, uh, traditions in the town. Um, and then the other the next thing that you can do is you can then ex you can show how those aspects change over time. Um, so uh, different from like other map drawing games, instead of drawing one map, you draw two maps. One map of the town then. Uh, which is the town as it was in the past before the people who left and returned left uh, and uh, a map of the town as it is now um, and when it, whenever you add one aspect you can also show how that aspect has changed uh, in, in, in between uh, those two times um, and explore those changes um, and the final thing you can do is you can drill down uh, into a lot more detail by playing out character, role playing out uh, 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 scenes between the characters uh, to really get into the, the nitty gritty of how those changes have affected the, the, the people uh, and how the people, like the, your characters kind of relate to each other and um, interact with each other uh, with all of this in mind. Um, so that's kind of like the, the gist of what the game is. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, the game came to be, 
um, obviously there was a lot of development and playtesting. Uh, the the single uh, the dual map thing didn't come about in like the earliest versions of the game. Um, and you can see here, there's a lot of like playtests that were done on Miro. Um, and I also ended up making like a little play kit that you can use in Miro as well. Um, um, so uh, we also I also added the relationship tracking map uh, and made it like a codified thing. And the way the prompts and questions worked uh, also changed a lot with uh, playtesting. Uh, so I really owe a lot to like the, the game design friends and just like... Um, um, random people actually like 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 tabletop rpg fans who like uh helped out uh, playtesting uh in playtesting the game uh and yeah like i i i loved all these like playtest games that we we played so much that are like some of the artwork in the the zine actually are references uh to to those games um and i also really really thankful to vanessa tang who did the artwork of the game she did an amazing job uh in reflecting this um change and nostalgia uh uh between uh, like something in the past and and like a more modern future which we we used Aru in KL uh as the the touchstone um because there's the, uh, uh, um all these old kampong houses uh in the middle of like a big modern city uh and we've we we used that kind of like as a a key image that we reflected in the cover uh and just the general vibe of the artwork in the game as well to like reflect a bit more a uh, Malaysian feel to it um because this game is actually quite quite uh, a personal game, um, I started making it in 2019 um, as part of uh, Homebound. Uh, I, I made a, uh, an anthology zine in 2019 um, that collected three games about uh, home and going away um, on the occasion of me moving back from Melbourne to, uh, to, to Malaysia. Um, and, uh, and Altogether Different River was supposed to be a part of this anthology. Uh, I had started designing it, but like I got stuck and I couldn't finish it in time uh, for, for the zine before I, I, I left. Um, so I shelved it and, and um, I thought, okay, it would be nice to actually like design this game in Malaysia when <laughs> after I like, had the experience of like moving back to a place I used to call home. Um, but 2020 was strange and weird uh, for everyone. Um, so I found myself with a lot of time because I did not have a job. Uh, and so I push myself to like make uh, a bunch of games on, on itch uh, and make a game a month in 2020. Um, and that was a motivation for me to actually finally finish and also get a different river. Uh, I didn't end up finishing it until like maybe like July, August, 2020. Um, but even though it took me almost half a year to like, like finish the game, it, uh, it was a good, good thing. It was a good impetus to like actually finish like the, the making the other games in, in between was like a good practice to like finally finish this this game that I've been stuck on for for quite a while. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, I went through all the other refinements, uh, playtesting development uh, and put together the version that you see today uh, on uh, Kickstarter as part of Zine Quest, which was a cool uh, it's a cool initiative that, that Kickstarter does uh, every year, uh, encouraging um, tabletop RPG designers to put out zines or small format books um, uh, as short uh, projects uh, in about February, March every year. Uh, and that was a great experience and, and being able to like connect to other game designers that were also doing similar things uh, and were also great a great help to me. Uh, Giles Pritchett, um, was uh did me a real solid and like helping me with like international shipping to australia uh and also like like uh the folks from soul muppet uh, uh four rogues and floating chair uh help elsewhere as well um so i had a great experience up uh, getting an altogether different river um um designed completed and 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 built like the the zines to to everyone uh and i owe a lot of that to to all the people who helped me along the way uh and yeah, it, it's a small kind of like personal game uh, because it reflects my personal experiences of, you know, uh, I moved to to uh, Melbourne and I lived there and I worked there and I learned more about games there um, and, and like started designing tabletop RPGs um, for like, yeah, for, for quite a long time. And then I moved back to, to, to Malaysia uh, and just grappling with all the ways things have changed, uh, like how I have changed as well and how my friends and family have changed through all that time. Um, and altogether, Different River kind of like reflects my anxieties and, and um, 
trepidation and like feelings about all that happening um and it's kind of like a coda to the, the homebound project that i mentioned before um and so like homebound also had a thing in there where it was about um what i wanted to do with with game design and like um reflecting like my personal experiences and um, things that i wanted to say and express um that i could do through games because games is the medium that i know um and so that kind of like continues the uh what i wanted to start with homebound and like what a, what a, a statement or a statement of intent i guess with what i wanted to do with games um but being a part of that uh game a month 2020 uh project as well um let me let me think differently about like personal games um and how like another thing that i love doing is like making like small shit post games which are like little joke games and like in a tweet or several tweets or like in a single page um and i think of those as like per very personal games as well because they reflect my personal tastes uh and the ways i think about making jokes and making games as like really maybe frivolous but important parts about like being human um and so even though like an altogether different river is like a classically heartfelt, I don't know, like serious personal game, but I don't think of it as the only way that games can be personal. Uh, and I feel very strongly about like my other games being personal as well, because they reflect who I am. Uh, they reflect my biases and, and tastes um, and what I think about games. Um, so uh, I guess if I wanted to end uh, uh, this thing on parallels here about personal games is that personal can be more than just serious. It can be, it reflects like a wide variety of like weirdness of like the full human experience. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you can find all the stuff that I do uh, at Aaron Lime on Twitter and on uh, itch.io. Uh, and thank you so much for listening. I am very thankful for, for parallels and free play. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, joining us next is Gwendolyn Foster from the Philippines, um, who is in a constant state of absolute chaos, working with a bunch of really cool indie, uh, indie teams uh, whilst making games uh, rooted in Philippine culture. Gwen will be presenting Soup Pot, uh, a delightful game um, that she and, and the Chicken Club uh, team are working on. Um, in Soup Pot, players make food uh, with a wide variety of uh, supermarket or locally sourced ingredients uh, in traditional kitchens. Hello everybody, uh, it's such an honor to be speaking at Parallels. Uh, it's one of the conferences or actually experience that I have always wanted to have and it's such a privilege to be talking about the creative process behind the game that we're making. So for a background, my name is Gwen Foster. I am technical director at a studio called Chicken Club and we're making a game called Soup Pot. I am here to talk about chaos, connection, and culture, which I think are the three most important things that we have stuck to while we were making the game. And this is how I have structured the talk. So one of the ways that we actually go through the pandemic is that Trina and I used to do weekend game jams where we just, you know, make a simple concept of a game or an idea that we've always wanted to see. And one of the things that Trina and I have always talked about is that we wanted to make a cooking game that was something we wanted to play with. So in real life, you don't actually do things like step by step or maybe you do maybe it's just me but whenever like I'm cooking in the kitchen um, I would turn on the stove like I would have something marinating like in the chiller I would try to find where I put you know chili or where did I put the soy sauce and 
that whole chaotic energy was something that we wanted to capture. So we made a small game called Putahe ng Ina Mo. Uh, it's actually a one minute game and the name itself is a wordplay on a cuss word in Filipino but it literally translates to your mom's dish and Trina and I both decided that we wanted to make a dish that was you know one of the dishes that was very special to us which is sinigang power soup um, it's been named recently as like one of the top dishes top soup of the world so I would highly suggest that if you have access to it definitely try it and you know like I would love to make one if we ever do meet in real life um, so yeah so here when we were making the game um, we wanted to capture that chaos but at the same time it's organized and controlled chaos so this game was designed to be one minute each date is 15 seconds and that was dictated by the change of color in the water um, or the change of shader and then you had 15 seconds to put in the ingredient at that certain time the thing here is that like it was very brutal not a lot of people actually could make the dish i have only done it twice and i have made the game and that's even like you know with a full list and a lot of people joke that like it was like the dark souls of of cooking which we found really funny but at the same time we realized that through this experiment a lot of people actually just wanted you know to make like a cooking game that is as close as to real life as possible so we decided you know to pitch the game and then we did secure funding for a year of development and you know we just wanted to make sure that we build the game that stays true to that chaos but is still rooted in some sort of system so when we were making it um just so that people know i added a queso which is cheese flavored ice cream chocolate ice cream and then ube ice cream ube which is pandemic to the philippines i added them to the game but they actually have no use and they just look super pretty but i think that is the beauty of giving creativity to the one who's crafting their own experience you know like not everybody cooks the same way like i do i think you know some people would actually you know cook by the book um but for a lot of us like growing up you had to eye it or you had to listen to your ancestors uh, whether it's salt and i guess you know that also relates to why in every cookbook they always say salt to taste because it actually is you are dictating the experience that you want to be and i think that's like super powerful with cooking so here is our game um and as you can see there are a lot of different variations to the same dish um so we definitely started again with sinigang but Sinigang, as a lot of people know it, is pork sinigang. But the truth is, you know, there it's beef sinigang. It's you you could have bangus sinigang na bangus sinigang na hipon. So that is sinigang with of milkfish and then sinigang of shrimp. There is also the controversial sinigang na chicken. Um. So the thing is that when we were looking through this and the variations of the different recipe we found out that there is a base uh, of what determines what a dish is and because you know Trina and I aren't actually chefs we hired a chef and a cook to help us guide through the process to make sure that we were creating the cooking experience appropriately and translating it properly into games 
because we started with dishes from the Philippines, like there, we've come to realize that there are some similarities in other culture, but how do we wrap this game? Which is where Cookbook comes in, the social media platform. Like we needed a wrapper that would make the game feel natural and easy to pick up for players. So we thought of using social media. And the thing with social media, especially over the past year, we've set the game in the pandemic. So you're a player and you're streaming it. You're streaming and people like comment. Um, so we wanted to make the social media feel alive and reference what was happening while we were making the game. And of course, as you know, there is the war of the toilet paper. There was an ostrich in the Philippines that got cut loose uh, and it trended a lot on social media. Um, that story doesn't actually end really well. Between the cooking sessions or learning a recipe, we feel that like having this news like would be a good downtime filler. Um, that also, you know, showcases like some of our humors or how absurd the past year has been. Um, there was also, you know, this wake up call midway that we actually have to confront the loneliness of the situation and how isolating like we had to explain to the players and I think like that was something that we decided early on like everything had to make sense like why are you cooking by yourself so we just said it like in the pandemic because it is it is our experience and our commonality one of the things that I actually really enjoyed is that because of the social media aspect of it we wanted a way to tell people to support loving local or you know buying from a farmer or an organic um, farm versus a supermarket and versus you know an in industrial factory that doesn't pay its workers uh, minimum wage and I think we did that here so I had a lot of fun and so I just wanted to part words with you that's something I have lived with for the past decade which is Lumika or in English create Lumigaya um, you know find your own joy and then Lumaya which is be free so Maraming salamat. Um, I hope that once we're ready to show Supat, you would love the game just as much as we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen. Um, I'm actually pretty hungry now. All that food looked pretty delicious. <laughs> Um, up next is Alicia Stone from Myriad Games Studio, based in Tasmania. Alicia is a maker of digital things. She's the creative director at Myriad and is also a business analyst at RACV. Alicia's role at Myriad Games Studio constantly varies, ranging from narrative to level design, from art making to marketing. Uh, tonight, she'll be presenting Where the Snow Settles, a game about loss, growth, and the supernatural. Before we get started, I pay respect to the traditional and original owners of this land, the Muwanina people, to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal people who are the custodians of this land. Hi, I'm Alicia. I am a part-time games maker who has been working on a title called Where the Snow Settles. It's a short, simple adventure that follows the journey of a young woman as she is thrust into the unknown in an unforgiving world. It's a low demand experience focusing on gentle and soothing gameplay. And the best part is that you can play through the game on one nice quiet evening. As a part-time games maker, it's really easy to feel like an outsider. 
This was actually a really big journey for our little team, so I'll share some insight into how we navigated through to shipping our first major title. I'll go a bit more into the underlying themes of the game, how we portrayed them, and how they have slipped into our lives over this journey too. Where the Snow Settles explores the themes of liminality and the fear of change through the lens of the player character Aurelia. Navigating through periods of change is necessary in order for us to grow, but these times can often be accompanied with a lot of challenges. Change can be scary, unpredictable and chaotic. We can feel out of place or feel in between when going through change. People can support you through though, and change is crucial for growth. We all encounter this weird liminal space throughout our lives. Sometimes we voluntarily do something new and scary, and other times it might be forced upon us. The game has three major pillars or target areas that we wanted to focus on communicating. The first one is gentle and soothing gameplay. We also wanted to focus on a sister relationship narrative, but with a calm and bittersweet mood and tone. Our journey to release Where the Snow Settles is one filled with learnings. As a team, we wanted to learn all about the process of making games as the main objective for this project. For some of us, this would hopefully lead to full-time employment in the games industry, and for others it meant focusing on obtaining skills that could also be used in other industries to help us progress our careers there. Sometimes it was also just an excuse to hang out with our closest buddies and focus on a shared goal while supporting each other through that journey. Most of the time, it was just a big excuse to eat lots of cake. We'd all completed tiny little game projects here and there in the past, but nothing that was released for sale on any major platforms. This was a process we wanted to go through, but had no idea how to get there. The main way we worked through this uncertainty was to gather perspective and get help from others. We originally started off with some concepts that were heavily grounded in fantasy, but this wasn't working well for us as we just didn't have the skills to pull something like that off. We were going round and round deciding what we wanted this game to be for quite a while. Instead, we decided to pivot and went through a period of consulting with a range of people, and this gave us some fantastic exp uh, perspective to reframe our approach to the game in a way that was realistic. We also had to acknowledge the reality of our situation. We were part-time. If we wanted it to ship anything, we will need a clear direction and be ready to constrain everything outside of that. Nothing can be perfect, and we can't iterate and reiterate over the same thing again until it's perfect. We just have to ship and move forward. The major thing that we focused on for the game was the unknown. The unknown can be scary, unpredictable, chaotic, and can have great impact on our mental health and our enjoyment of life. We settled on this theme because it was something that resonated with the whole team. We're all encountering the unknown in some form or another on a regular basis, whether it be finishing significant life stages like school, uni or jobs, moving places, people coming and going from your life or our old mate COVID. Dealing with periods of uncertainty is tough and society and education often don't set us up to work through it very well. We wanted to create a small piece of work that at least explores these ideas to bring them to the surface in our own small way. Overall, we wanted gentle and soothing gameplay with moments of reflection and stillness. Because we're addressing conflict within the player, there has to be areas of the game that feel more sinister to demonstrate the difference between places where the character does and doesn't feel safe. We wanted Aurelia to literally move between two very distinct liminal spaces to make the concept of stepping out into the unknown a little bit more tangible to the player. We see two environments changing and are revolving around her and she isn't sure which one she really belongs to. The first is the real world. It's familiar, predictable and has a quiet beauty to it. But there are hints of change in the air when we join her at the start of her journey. The unknown can be scary, so we wanted to contrast the character's everyday world with one that was familiar, but foreboding, dark, and less welcoming, and this is what we call the spirit world. There's mysterious spiritual energy and ethereal forms that surround Aurelia, 
highlighting that she feels like a visitor and doesn't have a sense of agency or place. Coping with the fear of change and facing the unknown is expressed differently through each of the characters in the game. We play as Aurelia, who is young and finds new or unusual spaces a little overwhelming when she's by herself. I'm sure we've all felt like her at some point in our lives. When we're first introduced to Aurelia, she's introspective, curious, but unconfident and self-interested. After her journey, she becomes more confident and compassionate. As she gets more confident in her own skin, she's also able to help others as a result. She's less worried about her own self-interests because she has the strength and resilience to get through tough situations now. She's able to face her fear of change by getting perspective, listening, and by introspection and observation, and also just by being brave and pushing forward and embracing her curiosity. Aurelia's curious traits are highlighted via the interactables mechanic, which serves as the main way of interacting with the world around her. Interactables will trigger player monologues, giving context and filling out the narrative. Some interactables will also allow Aurelia to progress through barriers in the environment. This is our primary method of introducing story points to the player. Anything with that little diamond symbol is something we call an interactable, so here's an example of a few. Another mechanic we have in the game is our freckle points. They're triggered just like any other interactable, but result in a camera angle change and a visual border being placed around the screen. The player can linger on these moments for a while if they wish. The intention of this mechanic is to highlight Aurelia's introspective trait, to direct the player to moments of reflection and stillness, and to highlight an appreciation of the small things. We also learn about different relationships and influences on Aurelia's growth through dialogue. The main intention of this mechanic is to highlight that we can learn and gain perspective from others. Another major character in the game is Aurelia's older sister, Esther. Esther's character traits are quite different from Aurelia. She's dutiful, independent, and competent. Esther embodies the idea of a support network, but also provides a contrast point to how people work through change differently. Esther's brash, confident, and energetic. The way she deals with the unknown is by going out and diving headfirst into the situation. She leans heavily on gut instincts, confidence, and thinking on her feet. Esther demonstrates what we are capable of when we see change as a positive situation and have confidence in our abilities. At Myriad, we threw ourselves into a situation full of unknowns, so we definitely took the Esther style approach for this one. Making games has enough unknowns even as a practice studio, so navigating this whole process was an invigorating challenge for a few makers from Tassie. Whilst making this game, we were also seeing life happen around us too. Engagements, New jobs, new houses, and new cities were all on the agenda, so change was something we just couldn't avoid. In our game making journey, we all had to rely heavily on our support networks. We had friends and family pitching in to help test the game or provide feedback. Others just came along to hang out. Some were there to tell us when we were getting too tired and needed to rest, and others helped us in those hard discussions about how to balance game making with the rest of our lives and careers. Without their support, we probably would have given up a long time ago or would still be chipping away at it today. One key relationship in my life is with my twin sister, Emily. We're both part of Myriad, so we've been working on the game together. The Aurelia and Esther relationship is inspired by the closeness of our relationship and how we learn from and support each other. It is worth noting that the game characters aren't Emily and I and have different drivers, motivations and conflicts, but this was a familiar lens in which I could approach writing about support networks. 
It's likely that you have a few people in your life that are absolutely core. Without them, you wouldn't be who you are today. These people support you, encourage you, and console you through all your challenges. And without this, it's really hard to flourish. Definitely don't forget to reach out to them when you need them most. Thank you so much, Alicia. Our final speaker for the night is Julian Wilton from Victoria. Uh, Julian is a creative director at Massive Monster, and he has a passion for drawing faces on things uh, while his work spans across multiple disciplines of uh, visual communication, art installations, and games, um, and often involves a giraffe. Julian will be presenting the Mass uh, Massive Monsters brand new game, Cult of the Lamb, um, fresh out of the oven. In Cult of the Lamb, players start their own cult in a cute, colorful and wicked land of false prophets. Hello and welcome Parallels. Uh, I'm Julian Wilton. I'm the creative director over here at uh, Massive Monster. Uh, this is my little uh, office working from home. Uh, and yeah, um, today I'm going to show you something a little special. A new game that we've kind of been working on uh, that we kind of recently announced. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through it and kind of walk you through the process, tell you how we made it. Uh, and yeah, let's bloody jump into it. All right, yeah, uh, so before I get too into it, I'll just tell you a little bit more about Massive Monster. Uh, we're made up of three directors and we make kind of console and desktop games uh, with a kind of focus on personality and play in them. Uh, the first game we released was The Adventure Pals, which was primarily me and the design director. And it um, was received quite well, um, going on to win numerous awards, including an Australian Game Developer Award. Uh, but commercially, we got quite lucky with it and with the timing and kind of getting a big YouTuber to cover it, which resulted in a modest success, um, which, you know, otherwise the project, you know, could have failed. Um, then we had um, Never Give Up, which was a bit of a contract job, but we also had some equity in it that uh, Jay and the other director worked on. Um, the game was a massive flop. It was received well, but yeah, it kind of did not make its money back. Uh, it's yet to make its recoup, basically. So, um, so I know, so I knew on the next project we did, we would need to kind of approach things a little differently, just because this this track record, you know, it's a bit um, unreliable. Uh, and it kind of led me to kind of thinking about more of a uh, marketing first approach to make sure we were developing something that had a proper consideration for marketing, so that we could keep our studio afloat and keep making weird games. Um, and also, you know, trying to keep our design philosophies of, yeah, making weird games and kind of putting our personalities and creativity heavily into them. Uh, and yeah, it kind of led us to our current project, yeah, Cult of the Lamb. Uh, this title, yeah, we've been working on it for a few years now. It's being published by Devolver Digital and had some early funding from Film Victoria. The game is about starting your own cult of cute critters as a possessed lamb. Uh, destroying any non-believers that get in your way. Uh, we have like really awesome trailer for it, so you know, go go check it out. I'm not gonna show it now, but go do it. Um, and yeah, the game basically is kind of like uh, a few, it's basically just a few mush genres together. So we've kind of got like a base building elements and colony management, and then we kind of have this dungeon crawling side to the game. Uh, we're inspired from games like RimWorld, Don't Starve, Stardew Valley, Enter the Gungeon, etc. Um, but the way to kind of make this work is we kind of have to connect these genres. We kind of have to make them feed into each other. Um, each side of the loop has to encourage the player to go further on the opposite loop. 
Moonlighter was a bit of uh, inspiration for this, where you kind of go out into a dungeon, collect loot, and then sell that loot in a shop that you run. So on the dungeon side of things, uh, we, we, you know, it's a bit of a classic dungeon crawler. You go out, you fight dudes, you, um, you know, beat them up, beat up those big baddies, and then, um, you know, you'll collect some loot, you get some resources, and find new followers for your cult, new recruits. Uh, while also progressing, you know, a bit of a story in the game. Uh, back at your base, um, you'll kind of indoctrinate your new followers who will worship you and do tasks for you. Through worship, you'll gain divine inspiration, which unlocks new buildings for you to build. Um, but you'll need to look after them, look after these little followers, keep them happy, fed, faithful, uh, ends alive. R.I.P. Um, otherwise, you know, they might turn against you. So we've got some naughty boys over here. You know, they're all, they're kind of turning on you. But, you know, fear not, fear not. We've got a solution. Um, you can deal with them through a bunch of ways. Uh, this is a sacrificial ritual, which is, um, you know, pretty effective at getting rid of them. Um, and we also have kind of sermons that you can kind of preach the beliefs and values to your cult and kind of customize your cult through that way, kind of changing the followers' uh, thoughts. Uh, so, yeah, how did we kind of get to this point? Um, this has actually been one of the hardest games for us to make. Uh, there was a lot of iteration and struggle to apply running a cult to the prototype we kind of had. And this is, this is kind of the first prototype we had. So we started with something that looked like this. It was called Sky Scouts, and it was something... It was about um, having a little community on the back of a flying whale uh, while scouting out new locations and getting loot for your base. So yeah, we had the kind of two sides to it there going down to the dungeon and your base. Uh, we had the basic loop and we thought it was really engaging and had a lot of potential. But after reflecting on the troubled success of our other games, I knew we needed to make sure we were approaching this one differently. Mushing the, on, mushing the genres was good, but we needed to go further and think about how to sell it. Now, some of you may think this, is, this way of development is a bit commercial, maybe a bit evil, you know? Um, but really, I just see it as a way to most effectively communicate and connect with our players while also keeping us happy as we get to keep making the games we want to make as a studio and support ourselves. So I'll go through the process of that as it wasn't too easy. Uh, so yeah, we started with the first idea, which was, you know, the flying whale. Um, but the problem was we kind of suck at 3D and couldn't really do the idea justice. And also the game was a bit generic beside the flying whale bit. Um, idea two, we cut the whale and we thought, how about your god who needs to gain followers to get back into the afterlife and get more powerful and also has to eat his followers? Um, great, I thought originally, but it's a bit confusing to communicate as it doesn't really explain the gameplay at all. After that, we liked the darker nature that was coming out in these ideas, so we kind of doubled down on that and made a game about running a hell or an afterlife as a demon. Awesome! I thought, but as soon as we got to making torture devices, uh, I, we really didn't want to hurt our little colony, our little, our little followers in there. Uh, and instead we thought, why don't we kind of swap it around and make the game kind of focused on the colony first. We thought, let's make the game all about the followers slash the colony, um, as that is what's going to be the kind of glue between the gameplay sections. So they kind of feed into each other through them and also well work well in the marketing, which led us to being a cult leader, <laughs> uh, while, you know, carrying across some of these occult themes that we wanted. Uh, I like this idea as if you sacrifice a follower in a, in a cult, you know, they'll be, they'll be happy to kind of die for the cause. So, you know, it kind of made sense. Whereas in a hell, you know, you're just hurting them, which is kind of sad. Um, so, you know, it was kind of, e you know, it was easy to understand. We had the player fantasy of like running a cult. It was a unique experience. We had the hook. It was all, it was all kind of working. You know, and we kind of wanted to do it in our style, um, you know, so we could keep it, keep it quite cute, but also quite dark. And this inspirations kind of come from shows like Over the Garden Wall, where they kind of have this like much darker side to it. Um, and yeah, we could also kind of appeal to quite a few different audiences and I could still kind of draw silly faces on things. Um, so we started developing this idea. I used a lamb as the main character as it had a lot of deeper meaning across religions and cultures, usually in depiction of holiness. 
Um, from there, we created our followers for the cult. I want it to be animals as we can keep them non-gendered, cute, and I really wanted a cult of giraffes. Um, this is from our uh, original pitch video. Uh, and yeah, after that, we kind of got, we successfully got some funding from Film Vic to take us to a vertical slice. Uh, and we kind of pitched to the publishers and got lucky enough to get a deal with Devolver Digital. And um, this is just kind of our one pager here. So luckily enough, the marketing approach seems to kind of work, at least for getting funding for the game. Um, and there have been a ton more iterations since then, but this is when we figured out the game we wanted to make and have been on track since. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. Thanks everyone for listening and a big shout out to our amazing team working on the game and Film Victoria for the early funding. If you have any questions or anything, uh, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Julian Wilton underscore thingy. Um, and yeah, enjoy Parallels. Um, thank you so much, Julian. That was, that was quite, quite lovely. Um, well, we've made it to the end of the night. Uh, what a what a fantastic lineup of amazing games made by wonderful people. Um, I have one last thing to announce, and this has been something uh, that's that's uh, you know it's been a long time coming. Uh, but uh, this event will actually be the the last event that I present as director of free play. Um, being in this position for five long and tireless years not only makes me the longest standing director, uh, but much like the past directors before me, it makes me both proud, but also very tired. Um, I'm a little sad to be leaving. Uh, I really love doing what I do, um, but I also need to acknowledge that I'm quite burnt out and, and that I really need a break. Um, Free Play is an organization that heavily relies on the energy and drive of the director. And I feel like I've given all that I possibly can um, with no regrets. I think the organization now needs new leadership with uh, fresh perspectives and the energy and drive that the community deserves. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have full faith that whoever comes next into leadership will take free play um, to where it needs to go next uh, with the community. And that's, that's something that I look forward to. Um, to me, free play is important because it acts as space for emerging artists to find their people, uh, to be given an opportunity to speak for the very first time to showcase and spotlight their work. Uh, my time at Free Play actually began as a volunteer back in 2009. Um, we need Free Play because there are many artists and game makers out there whose work and practice doesn't quite fit within the industrial game development framework, um, and nor does it quite fit in the world of art either. Um, some people's works are just too artsy for the games world and, and too gamey for the art world. Um, and so free play acts as a home and, and safe haven for those people. And I really hope that it continues to do so. Um, I'm really proud of how far free play and its community has come over the last five years. Uh, it's been amazing to watch parallels grow from, you know, 70 70 odd people at Acme in 2014, um, to having a full house at the Capitol um, with over 550 people in 2019. Um, and our online parallels streams have, have grown even bigger since then with you know, thousands of viewers across um, the live stream and, and hundreds in the zone as well. Um, during my time as director, I free play received federal level arts funding um, for the first time through the Australia Council for the Arts. And we did that not once, but twice. And I know that that was a, a goal for free play um, since the very beginning of the organization, um, you know, 15 odd years ago. Um, I'm also really proud of the broader representation of um, international voices at free play, particularly coming from Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of how we've successfully pivoted the festival online 
um, for the last two years of free play and parallels. Um, it was no easy feat, um, but the team worked extremely hard to, to make it happen. And I'm, I'm super proud. Um, I'm really proud of all the arts organizations and venues that we partnered with across the last five years. Um, you know, Acme, Testing Grounds, Siteworks, City of Melbourne, Creative Victoria, Film Victoria, uh, VMDO, Voiceworks, um, National Young Writers Festival, just to name a few. Um, there's just so much more to be proud of, you know, like the Hover Garden Night Market, the, the Zone, all our keynotes, our speakers, and, and you know, plenty more. Um, and I know that all of this wouldn't be possible without uh, the amazing and hardworking people that I um, have had the privilege to, to collaborate with and work with um, over the last five years. Um, I feel extremely honoured and privileged um, to have worked with them. Um, and so I want to say thank you and, and congratulations to the, the Parallels 2021 team. Um, getting a bit choky here, so bear with me. Um, I want to thank um, Ben Turner, Goldie Bartlett, uh, Prika Sachdev, Terry Burdak, um, along with the, the Zone producers, Jay Stewart, Cecile Richard, and, and Andrew Gleason. Um, I want to thank uh, Cole Williams um, for the amazing visual identity and Dan Golding for the fantastic video trailer. In addition to Parallels, I also want to thank the, the rest of the Free Play team, um, Jeannie Maxwell, Jason Imms, Andrew Brophy, and, and Tiara. Um, thank you to all our volunteers across the last five years. Um, you've all been amazing to work with. Um, I know that some of the team members um, will also perhaps be departing as well. And um, I wish them the very best. Um, please do uh, send them your love on, on social media once they've announce their, their departures. Um, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Free Play Board for all of their trust, support and patience. Um, thank you to Claire Matthews, Georgia Simmons, Travis Jordan, Alice Pryor, James Paddo, uh, Helen Stuckey, Dan Golding, Jason Imms and Doug Wilson. Um, putting, putting together a, a festival is no easy feat. Um, I kind of found out the hard way. Um, so I, I also want to thank and commend all the past free play directors um, for, their, for their courage and, and commitment. So um, thank you, Catherine Neal, Marcus Westbury, Eve Penford, Paul Callahan, Harry Lee Shanglun, Katie Williams, and Dan Golding for all of their contributions. Um, I want to I wanna thank my partner and soulmate, uh, Helen Kwok, uh, who I actually met, uh, I met at free play. Um, I want to thank her for all of her love and care for being there with me when I needed it the most. Um, I couldn't have done it without her um, and our, our little furry cat, Aslan, as well. Um, finally, I, I wish uh, Freeplay and its future director all the best. Um, filling in the big shoes of the director role is, is not going to be easy, but I know that whoever comes next will be in good hands with such a loving and, and supportive board and community. Um, I'll still be around um, curating events through Hover Garden with Andrew Brophy and friends. I'll be focusing a lot more on my own personal game making practice uh, with my partner, Helen. Um, I really miss making games. It's been, it's been too long. Um, and I'm, I'm actually blessed to, to have gotten a, a bit of taste of that this year and, and I really can't wait to get further into it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. I would have loved to give and, and receive hugs uh, from you all in person, um, but we're just gonna have to do with warm tweets and, and messages um, to, to me and, and the rest of the team. Um, rain check on those hugs though. Um, a big shout out to Creative Victoria for hosting us at Melbourne International Games Week. A big thank you to RMIT for blessing us with the capital for the zone. Um, lots of love to our uh, sponsors, House House and Two Point Interactive. 
Um, free play will be back in the future and we really hope to see you there. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you all continue to make experimental and personal games to continue to take risks and be critical um, and to continue to think about how your games uh, and game making may be positioned and framed as arts practice. Um, I love you all. Thank you for being part of this wonderful community and take care. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Golding. I'm a former director of Freeplay and I'm currently on the Freeplay board. I'm coming to you tonight from Wurundjeri country. It's unusual for me to make an appearance here and thank you so much for your indulgence. You might know by now that Chad has told us that this is his last event as Freeplay director. That's a sad moment. Chad has done so much for free play, more than many people will ever know, I think. But it's also a happy moment, too, as we get to reflect on these years where Chad's been running the show and for also for him to join the likes of Lee Shanglin, Katie Williams, Paul Callahan, Eve Penford, Catherine Neal and Marcus Westbury as former free play directors out there doing amazing things. Chad's been running Free Play since 2017, and I want to give a heartfelt thanks on behalf of the Free Play board for his care, his passion, and most of all, his heart. But you know, Free Play is really just not as good at being an institution as it is being a community. And so we thought we would ask some of the Free Play community to tell us about Chad. So, on behalf of the board, Chad, thank you so much. And here's what our community had to say. Chad is an icon. Chad is an absolute legend. Honestly, could you imagine Melbourne's game scene without Chad in it? No, I can't. I wouldn't want to. Frankly, I think we would all be completely lost without him. I'm glad we're not in that timeline. Mm. He's always enthusiastic and approaches everything with kindness and generosity. Chad is someone who wants more for everyone genuinely and makes it happen. Chad is prolific. Kind, considerate, and selfless to a fault. He is generous with his time, his knowledge, and his friendship. Chad is an absolute dreamboat and national treasure. Really cares a lot about uh, people uh, and the people who make games and the games that make people. Chad is a bit of a dark horse. Really? I don't know much about him. I remember thinking when I heard you would be the next director, this festival couldn't be in better hands. Because I remember all the things you did for free play before you were even director. I can't, <laughs> I can't name the amount of times that we would come to have a chat and I would be all prepared to tell you that you should be doing less and you'd have three new initiatives all lined up and a bunch of new games that you wanted to tell people about. He spends so much of his time and effort um, making free play as successful as it is and, and making sure it accommodates and gives the stand to like people who are on the margins, bringing voices from like Southeast, the Southeast Asian region as well into Australia, which I'm always very thankful for. The moment that stands out to me the most is probably just after the 2019 conference. And we were talking about the slam poetry session. And we were both in awe of how vulnerable everyone was, you know, getting up there and talking about things that matter to them, specifically the people of color. There was a anger and a, a passion and intensity that came from them and from what they had to say. And the audience was, you know, along for the ride, taking it in, welcoming them. That was all because of Chad. Chad, you created this beautiful space for people to just be and oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Chad, I want to say that you give us all the permission and the drive to create on our own terms. So you're just a force to be reckoned with and Parallels has become what I believe is one of the best, actually the best event, don't tell everyone else, the best event in the Australian game scene and you took Dan's vision and absolutely just ran with it and made it into something that I don't think any of us could have. The rapidly changing industry and culture of Melbourne is something that you've really helped to push forward. 
you've achieved so much for us you've achieved so much for yourself that we can all bring forward into the future I have a feeling that in the time that he's been director, he's completely transformed this festival and community. Um, I think you deserve some rest now. Big sleep, honestly, the biggest nap ever. Have the biggest nap and then we'll have the biggest party once this is all over. Just turn this festival into something that is so special, so uplifting, so there for the community in times when, you know, we can't be there for one another. Thank you, Chad. Thank you for endlessly advocating games as an arts practice. And thank you for making every one of us feel like we belong, especially those who are working at the fringes. Thank you for believing in this beautiful community and working so hard for it. It was fantastic working with you at Free Play, man. Thank you, Chad, for supporting and believing in my work. It means a lot to me. Good on you, mate. Thanks for, thanks for your effort. Chad? Thank you. Thank you, Chad. 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 With radiance and gratitude, thank you, Chad.